Hello, everybody, and welcome to the World Justice Challenge Finalist Showcase on Equal Rights and Non-Discrimination, Group B. Um, I am your moderator for this session, and my name is Betty Barka. I am originally from Fiji, but currently call Australia home, and I am here on behalf of the Civicus Board um, to be showcasing the incredible work um, done by some of these people that are here today. Um, we will continue to let people trickle in, but we, we will also start so as, so as to not disrupt the timing of the session. Um, just to provide a quick overview of the challenge, the World Justice Challenge 2022 is a global competition to identify, recognize, and promote good practices and high impact projects and policies that protect ad and advance the rule of law. This year's challenge is dedicated to recognizing projects that address structural inequities and governance weaknesses exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. Applicants were invited to submit a project for consideration in one of the three categories. Number one, access to justice. Number two, anti-corruption and open government. And number three, equal rights and non-discrimination. The World Justice Project received over 300 applications representing 118 countries. This group was narrowed down to 30 finalists who have joined us here at the forum. Um, sorry, give me. Five of these projects will win a $20,000 cash prize and which will be awarded at the forum closing plenary tomorrow. Um, there are 10 finalists in the equal rights and non-discrimination category. Five of them who are incredible and are present here today will showcase their projects for us. Um, a, a brief overview of the equal rights and non-discrimination category. Um, we all know that the global pandemic has weakened human rights protections and worsened uh, structural discrimination globally. The pandemic has exposed and exacerbated economic inequality, healthcare disparities, and gaps in education. It has taken a disproportionate toll on women and girls, migrants, ethnic and racial minorities, and other marginalized groups. These five projects make significant advances towards, towards countering these negative trends, strengthening equal rights protections, and dismantling systemic inequities. The five groups that are present here today and will be showcasing are the DC Justice Lab from the United States, which is represented by Petri Sultan. Uh, the second group is Ecociclo from Brazil, which is represented by Carla Godoy. Um, the third group is the Samuel Iron Foundation from Nigeria, which is represented by Gunan Iron Aloho. I am so sorry. I hope I'm saying that all right. Um, and the fourth group is Speak Up from Egypt, which is represented by Amira El Dahi. Um, and the last group is the youth LGBT organization Destiv from Bulgaria, which will be represented by Denita Lubinova. Um, so please, I, I urge you to welcome um, our, part, our showcase participants and finalists. Um, and in doing so, I will pass the mic on to Patrice to showcase the work from uh, DC Justice Lab. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be here. I was asked yesterday about what I want to get out of the forum, and I shared that I am here to learn a lot, but I also came to share a message. So I very much appreciate everyone who is here with me in this room to hear that message. I am a person who is extremely passionate about convincing people to think differently about who we punish, why we punish, and how we punish. The World Justice Project includes criminal justice in its rule of law index. And although it captures some important things like impartiality, where the United States ranks very low, there are other things that are hard to measure and report, like the enormous financial and human cost of having a criminal justice system as large as ours is. If there is only one message that I could have everyone here take home with them, it is that I want people to understand mass criminalization is not just inhumane, it is dangerous. Said another way, state violence causes more community violence. We are causing harm in the United States. Here's what it looks like to rely on capturing and caging instead of focusing on preventing harm. 
A lot of you may already know that the United States incarcerates a lot more people than other parts of the world. We're talking about 600 people per 100,000, which is much higher than you see other places. But what you may not understand is that if we look at black America, that number doubles to 1,200. So we're well beyond the stage at which the amount of, carcer of incarceration we're doing is reducing crime. We've gotten all the way to the point where it's driving crime up. We're destabilizing communities so much that crime is actually increasing. And you can look at this website for yourself, the World Prison Brief, and look up your own country. I did this with one of the organizations yesterday just for fun. And in their country of about 31 million people, they have the same number of pretrial detainees that we have in the city of Washington, D.C. alone. D.C. is about 10 miles across. We have 700,000 residents by comparison. D.C. is not a state. We are located in the United States, but we don't have statehood. And we're thought of as the most educated and most progressive jurisdiction in America. But in this location, we have over 80,000 police stops per year. That's during a pandemic. We have more than $200 million spent on community supervision. That's in addition to $500 million spent on policing. We have a 120-year-old criminal code that includes provisions that date back to our black codes and our slave codes. We have an all-black child prison. Our adult system has 94% of felonies are black people, even though we make up less than half the city's population. And we had the entire jail population in solitary confinement for more than a year during the pandemic. So two years ago, DC Justice Lab was started, two years ago today, in fact. And to let you know a little bit about how, where we came from, I am a, a trial lawyer uh, initially, and I came out of practice a few years ago to work on a really special project, rewriting the entire DC criminal code, all of the offenses and penalties. And I got this really fun skill, legislative drafting. And when the protests erupted in 2020 and people started thinking much bigger about how to transform America's criminal legal system, I got excited about that and I felt very well suited to tackle the problem of policing in Washington, DC. I knew the courts there, I knew the statutes there, I knew the procedures there, and I had an army of law students who were really energetic about working on these kinds of reforms. And so we got to work and DC Justice Lab was born and we have been working on the entire criminal legal system beyond policing since then. So when I think about the kinds of reforms that we focus our attention on, I'm reminded of one of the other rule of law index factors and that is the constraints on government powers or the way that I talk about it is limits on the authority of police, prosecutors and prisons. So if you look through our policing recommendations for example, you'll see that we've really made the argument that we don't have to live with our centuries old federal constitution as the only limit on police power. We can control when police can stop a car, when they can interrogate a child, when they can search someone's home, when they can use force against a protester, when they can saddle someone with an arrest record that will follow them for the rest of their life. We don't have to live with very vague statutes and very high maximum penalties and cross our fingers and hope for the best that prosecutors will use that authority uh, well. We can write much better laws and so that's what we've set about to do. I won't spend too much time here because it seems like a lot of people at this forum already appreciate that people-centered justice is really important. But one thing that I do wanna point out about what that means for us is that we think about directly impacted people as everyone who's affected by the justice system. We are very deliberate and intentional about eliminating the line drawing between people who have caused harm and people who have survived it. So this year, for example, we worked with formerly incarcerated people to put together our first ever safety summit. We are working with the Network of Victim Recovery of DC to write guidance for victims of crime who appear in resentencing hearings. And we published a racial equity impact assessment tool with the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. So our goal overall is really harm reduction and not division of community as we've seen in a lot of organizational structures in the US before now. I also wanna note that we really are sort of part of this first wave of funders from 2020 who trusted black leadership and didn't put a lot of restrictions 
on our work, and I think that made a huge difference in how quickly we were able to get ourselves together and to get, all, get some of the outcomes that we wanted to see happen. In addition to the projects that I mentioned earlier, I served on the DC Police Reform Commission, which published about 250 pages of recommendations for how to decenter police to improve public safety, and on the Jails and Justice Task Force, which published an implementation plan to decarcerate by half within 10 years. And these are some of the other policy changes that we've already seen within our first two years as an organization. I am immensely proud of my team and all that they have accomplished, and I am exceptionally grateful for all of you listening to me today and for thinking a little differently about how we punish, who we punish, and why we punish. So thank you very much. This one? Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Patrice. That was very insightful. A quick reminder to everybody in the room that each finalist will be giving an eight minute presentation, um, and the session will conclude with a 30 minute moderated discussion. And if we do have time, there will be opportunity for the audience to ask questions uh, to the sh showcase finalists. Um, I would now like to call upon Carla Godoy from EcoCiclo Brazil. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm super, super thrilled to be here today presenting EcoCycle and showing how EcoCycle creates opportunities for vulnerable women in Brazil through sustainable menstrual justice. Well, to start, to get us started, I would like to tell, tell you how we thought about EcoCycle, how we created EcoCycle. EcoCycle was born of a conversation among three vulnerable women from favelas in Brazil. We were talking about menstrual poverty and all the, the encounters that we've had in our lives with menstrual poverty, how it impacts our communities, and how hard it is to be women in our society. But I do have a question for you today. Do you know what menstrual poverty is? Well, we do. Uh, according to the UN, a menstrual poverty or period poverty is everything, all the hardships that women have to go through because they don't have access to menstrual products. And it also includes all the economic opportunities, all the opportunities that they miss because they don't have access to that, and all the hardships, uh, mentally and social hardships that they have to go through because of that. I do have a very personal story um, that represents and that also started the debate between us, between uh, our partners uh, of menstrual poverty. So one day I was going to the supermarket in my community and I found my mom's friend staring at the menstrual product aisle, trying to count her dimes to see if she had enough money to buy something for her that month. When she walked away, um, I knew that she didn't have it for this month and it was really hard for me because I do know how hard it is to be on your period and even like just imagine not having like something to help you during this time. Well, I was sure to be sure that she had what she needed and, but that story is stood with me. Like it stays with me even to this day. And because I don't know what happened to her the next month and I'm pretty sure that it happened to many, many other women all around the world that goes to menstrual poverty. But you must be asking yourself, how does this relate to justice? Because we are in a justice forum. Well, I'm gonna tell you. First, it's a matter of social justice. According to UNICEF, women and girls miss up to 45 days of school just because they don't have access to menstrual products. It harms their economy, it harms their families, it prevents them of getting out of the poverty line because they're women because they get their period. And this situation is even worse in Brazil because we are a continental country and 26% of girls don't have access to sanitary pads. We're talking about a, a continental country, we're talking about a huge population in which 51 million people live, live below the poverty line. So it's just too much, too much hardship. And it's also a matter of environmental justice. Well, one single sanitary pad takes up to 500 years to decompose, a normal one. The first sanitary pad cre ever created in the world is still around. So it's too much waste. 
And the, the one single person that menstruates uses up to 50,000 sanitary pads in your lifetime. So that's why we created EcoCycle. EcoCycle is the first ever Brazilian uh, biodegradable sanitary pad. And more than that, we are more than just a sanitary pad. We employ vulnerable women in our production. So we, we, we do believe that giving access, to giving women access to biodegradable sanitary pads and economic opportunities are going to change the social and economic um, aspects. We also uh, think that EcoCycle uh, is working with the democratization of access to menstrual products because we do know that um, um, ecological options for menstrual uh, for menstrual periods already exist, but they're not democratic. You have to have access to running water to be able to use the menstrual cup or the reusable sanitary pad. And when we talk about Brazil, uh, many, many houses don't have access to running water of the sewage uh, system. We have our impact model. We do believe that we create sustainable livelihoods. Uh, we have a cyclical logistics where women produce, use, and sell sanitary pads, biodegradable sanitary pads. We have a learning and a huge community of women taking care of women, and we share uh, information with our community about health, about work, about job opportunities, and we believe that women in the environment can thrive together, uh, making a more just society. And how do we do it? We have two models. We have a B2B and a B2C model. And the B2B, uh, the women produce, sell, and use the sanitary pads, and the B2C, and the B2C we have our uh, marketplace where other women can buy the sanitary pads through our marketplace. And talking about our marketplace, um, during the COVID pandemic, we uh, partnered with the Intermedical De De Development Bank and we uh, created a, a better uh, marketplace for other women that live in vulnerable conditions and produce their own products to sell their products through the marketplace. Uh, we noticed that those women um, did have access to um, business intelligence and uh, better business tools. And we were like, well, we do have it. Come, come sell with us, come be with us. And it's working. And how it works, we select the women, we train the women, and they start selling in our marketplace. And it's been really, really good. These are just two cases of two amazing entrepreneurs that we have in our marketplace. They produce and they sell their own products. They're all sustainable. And it's so amazing to see how those women are changing their own lives in their society, their communities. For, with the prize, we want our main goal, we have many, many goals for the future, but our main goal is to actually start producing certain type pads in the bigger demand to actually um, achieve the demand that we have, like the, the, the demand that we have. Because in the city where we're based, Salvador, they just passed a law where the government has to provide free uh, sanitary pads in schools, and we want those uh, sanitary pads to be biodegradable. And for do, to do that, we have to be able to produce enough sanitary pads to sell to the government. So the twenty uh, the twenty thousand dollars would be used to do that. And this is our team, our team team. Um, I am the financial director. I'm Carla. Uh, we are all uh, complementary to each other. We are all vulnerable women from favelas, and we know our public. We know uh, that the work that we do is so important because we are coming from this place. Uh, we have Ellen. She is our executive director. She lives in Salvador. And we also have Adriel. She also lives in Salvador, and she is our chemical engineer. She is responsible for actually creating aiding the sanitary pad and making it work. And we have Patricia, she is our director of marketing and sales, she's right there. And she can sell everything and anything. Um, and thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you, and if you haven't already been awed by the team, you should check out their booths, which is downstairs. All the finalists that have, all 30 finalists are um, showcasing their work in the booths downstairs. Um, my next 
uh, finalist that will be speaking has come from Nigeria, from the Samuel Oron Foundation, who, and this is Nugon Oron Aloho. I ex please excuse my pronunciation. I hope I got something right. Okay, this one. Hello. Okay. So it says Gunan Yoron Aloha. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, so I'm Gunan Yoron Aloha from Nigeria. And um, I grew up in a small community that marginalized women. And coming from that community, I'm so proud to stand before you today because. Um, I was considered too ambitious growing up and a lot of opportunities were not awarded to me. And this was the basis through which we started the Samuel Yaron Foundation. So that I was able to create opportunities for other women who like me are ambitious, but because of the community where we live in are not able to take control of all of those opportunities. And when we started Samuel Yaron Foundation, we just started with working with um, companies to distribute sanitary pads, working with organizations to improve education for girls, access to education for girls. And then in 2020, we began going to internally displaced camps to make distributions. And that was where we discovered that there were a lot of issues. So Nigeria mostly, like we already know, has issues concerning political instabilities and the Hedas crisis in Benue State, where I come from, where we have large numbers of displaced people living in internally displaced camps. And when we started at first, we were going to these internally displaced camps to make just distribution of products, sanitary pads, organic cups, and then food items. And then oftentimes, we discovered that most of those products were not being shared. So I met Yua. I'm a legal practitioner, so whenever I go to the internally displaced camp, I will always talk to them about the fact that I'm a lawyer, and I could also work to provide opportunities for them to also learn and further their education. And one of those days, you are not her real name, met up with me and spoke to me about the distributions that we conduct on camp. And there were a lot of allegations about telling us to handle distributions ourselves, because the way the camp works is, when you have items for distribution, you normally take them to camp, you hand them over to the camp officials, the humanitarian aid workers, and then they do the final distribution to the residents at the camp. And then we had Yua who told us that a lot of this distribution do not get to them, so they would appreciate if we're able to distribute ourselves. And from there onwards, we seek for permission, and then the permission was not granted for that particular round. But we now start asking questions around why do we keep giving products and these people also keep asking? Because you keep giving products in the internally displaced camps and you see that for every single time you go there, the people remain poor. They still need. And then they have the humanitarian officers who are supposed to be the people protecting them. So what is the issue? And when we start asking all these questions, we discover that there was something called sex in exchange for essential needs, where a lot of the women and girls on camp were asked to give, have sexual intercourse or be in sexual relationship with the humanitarian aid workers or the camp officials in exchange for essential needs that were being donated by people who needed to just support these people. And we discovered that we needed to expose all of these issues. And we started talking to some of the people who were like the camp agency managers. And sometimes we discovered that these camp officials also like hoarded some of these items and then sold them in exchange for more money. And some said because their pays were low, they needed money as well. Some of them did not have access to some of those products that were being distributed. For example, maybe I have um, a project where I have to deliver laptops to people, but I don't have a laptop myself. So maybe you feel a bit somehow distributing a laptop to someone else when you don't even have that yourself. So the humanitarian officers oftentimes don't also have items. So instead of distributing to the people that need them, they keep for themselves. We also discovered the power imbalances. Because we are the people who work in the development sector. Everybody believes we're supposed to protect. But instead, we also have a lot of injustices that occur within this sector. We are sometimes abusing the people that we ought to protect. And this was exactly what was happening because of the power imbalances. And then there was lack of human rights knowledge in the IDPs. They did not have any idea that they had rights. They just believed whatever was given to them was a privilege. 
So they took whatever, whenever you wanted to marginalize them, whenever you asked for sex, some of them were happy to be in those relationships because it meant they would get their essential needs. And then we discovered that we could launch a project where we're able to expose these issues. And then we launched the Rural Urban Rights Project with funding from Miserio, where we're able to redistribute essentials and then break the power relations that existed in this camp, especially between the humanitarian aid workers and the residents themselves. So the first thing we did, we had an interview with a lot of the girls, and all of those are on our website. Some of them were pregnant, and when they reported, they were dismissed from the camp. A lot of these girls were driven out of the camp when they had the interviews with us as well. But with the interviews, we're able to develop a curriculum guide on a distribution scheme, where if you're going to make distributions in the camp, you're able to do the distributions in a certain way that the end user would actually get it, instead of it passing through the humanitarian aid workers. That was going to break the power imbalances that already existed. And then we co-created several activities with the girls and women on camp, we did artworks together, the co-created artworks that spoke about some of the things that they went through, the kind of life they were expecting to live on the camp, and what they expected the government to do. We also designed a pad up campaign in collaboration with Kawambe and Organic Corp, where we distributed reusable cloth pads and menstrual cup to the girls. We also have an illustration book, which depicts the live experiences of all of these girls, and we use the illustration book with the curriculum guide to conduct campaigns and because of the exposure that we did on these issues, we discovered that a lot of the officials in camp were also trafficking some of these girls from the camp to other neighboring states in exchange for money. So when we did the project and then we had a lot of media attention, some of the officials were actually sacked and then replaced by other people. The impact. So we're able to visit six IDP camps in Nigeria. Visiting the IDP camps in Nigeria is a security issue because there are a lot of crises currently still ongoing, but we're able to reach out to 2,000 IDPs with knowledge of human rights, and they are able to now understand that they have rights to assess some of those products. We're also able to help with the replacement of camp officials, and some of the women now are able to occupy leadership positions, because in the past, women were not accepted to occupy leadership positions in those camps, because we have the the gender marginalization where men are superior to women. So most often, even in those camp, women do not have access to leadership positions. We're able to redistribute supplies in camp and then have sensitization programs with other nonprofit organizations so that they are also able to use the curriculum material that we've designed to conduct redistribution in those camps. And then we've increased reporting and criminalization of the issues around sexual exploitation as well, because more girls are now open to reporting, because they know if they report, there's an organization, there are now a group of people who can work to ensure that they get legal justice. We've also inspired further research so we have more people coming to seek materials from us because a lot of attention is now being geared towards the injustices in internally displaced spaces. And this also applies to refugee camps and the likes of them. So we've done a lot of trainings with girls, we've done works with them, and then we've also done the act exhibition whereby we showcase their works and we're able to sell some of this product. And in the hopes of selling this product and using the funding, to be able to set the girls up so that they are going to go back to school, some start businesses. Moving forward, we're looking to start a database where most of these girls coming to camp, the men, women alike, are able to have a structure where people are able to monitor the management of camp when they come in or when they get out. Because one of the biggest problems in the camp that exists is the lack of a proper database system. Nobody knows what's happened at the camp. Nobody knows where the donations go to, what they do. There's no improvement. There are no reintegration policies. So this is what we're working to ensure to do. Thank you. How incredible are these finalists? I, I assume everybody in this room does not envy the role of the judges who have been allocated the incredibly difficult task of finalizing and you know determining um, the shortlist and even further in the finals tomorrow. Um, but moving forward, I would now like to call upon um, Amira Aldahi from Speak Up Egypt to speak more about their incredible work. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. 
So I'm really happy and honored and a bit thrilled to be in front of you all here presenting our initiative, Speak Up. So let me just tell you first that Egypt um, has a reputation of sexual harassment and assaults against women. And in 2013, a um, study uh, made by the UN's Entity for Gender Equality estimated 99% of women in Egypt has been subjected at some point in their life to sexual harassment. Um, also, Cairo is one of the most dangerous places for women. It was counted like this. So, empowering victims to combat sexual harassment and gender-based violence in Egypt. That's what we mainly do as Speak Up. Who we are. Speak Up is an Egyptian feminist initiative that supports victims of violence in all its forms. Our mission is providing the legal and psychological solidarity needed for violence, of, uh, violence victims, spreading awareness and information accessibility to everyone, pushing the lawmakers into issuing legislations that ensure safe, violence-free community where women and minorities can thrive. What do we do or how we do this? First, we make campaigns against sexual harassment and rapists. We also offer pro bono legal and psychological assistance. We push for legislation's reforms. We raise awareness campaigns and we offer safe space for victims and minorities. I'm gonna talk about the first thing we do. So campaigns against sexual harassment. Here we work on two main axes, legal accountability and canceling harassment normalizing entities. In legal accountabilities, I'm so proud to say that we worked over 400 cases that ended up bringing justice to victims. Of course, due to the time limitation, I need only to mention two. This is our star, Michael Fahmi. He's a serial pedophile rapist. He used his image as a man of a church and a doctor to rape and violate minors and girls for years. There are tens of them. Finally, a group of victims decided to reach out for us. We built our case with the help of our legal team, and then we launched a campaign that had to last for one year of continuous fight to bring justice to those victims. After a year of hard work, a vicious fight against a very powerful and influential man, finally, he was put in prison for life. The second thing we would like to mention to you is Victor Sorrentino. He's from Brazil. He is, <laughs> no friend, sorry. <laughs> He is, um, he's actually a Brazilian influencer who has around 1,000 million on his, sorry, um, yeah, 1 million followers on his Instagram account. He was visiting a museum in Egypt in Luxor and he verbally harassed a girl there. He also recorded the incident and posted it on his Instagram account thinking it's funny. Um, a Brazilian activist reached out to us in Egypt and then we verified the video and we found out that was really verbal harassment. In a joint uh, campaign, we actually launched a campaign against him. He was caught, arrested, then later deported back to his country. Canceling harassment normalizing entities. So we also launched campaigns against business or content creators that promote or normalize harassment and rape uh, culture in their work and advertisement. Mentioning only two cases of that, that's Citroën, the uh, French company car. They launched an app that contained promotion for sexual harassment. So what we did is we launched also a campaign against, against them and it went so viral, they had to withdraw the app and issued a formal apology in French and Arabic. The second thing is Saad Mujarrat. He's a Moroccan singer who was accused of rape and violence in four different countries. One in the US, two times in France, one in Morocco. He also had to escape the US after he got bail. In France, he got bail for 150,000 euro and the Moroccan king sent him his personal lawyer to get him out. Saad al tried to have a concert in Egypt and we launched a viral campaign that actually canceled his concert, canceled the episode uh, of him in a talk show that was planned to be aired and also the promo was deleted from the social media. Saad al till now cannot actually do any events in Egypt. The second thing we do is that we offer pro bono legal and psychological assistance. So we, we can say that we provided free legal and psychological assistance to over 14,000 of victims, women, men, minors, LGBTQI community, connecting them to volunteers uh, who are actually professionals. 
We also pushed for legislation reforms. So we also launched viral campaigns calling for reform of legislations undermining women's rights or issuing new laws to protect women and girls from abuse. The um, example that I have for you here is that we advocated for amendments in the Egyptian law that criminalized female genital mutilation. So after a viral campaign by Speak Up, the suggested amendments were adopted by the Egyptian House of Representative Law um, and the law was activated in March 2021. Before that, female genital mutilation was never criminalized in Egypt. We also raise a lot of awareness campaigns. So we launch viral awareness campaigns with specific call to action to ensure and influence change. We do this through online awareness courses and live sessions to raise awareness. We we'll also do various awareness campaigns about women, white, gender-based violence and legal action. The impact to these campaigns is that we collected over 15,000 sexual harassment testimony, 20,000 testimonies of domestic violence, marital rape, bullying, virginity tests, and more crimes. We also were able to provide sanitary pads in public places. So after we started a certain campaign, um, free sanitary pads in more than 80 schools and 11 cafes were provided. We also serve as a reliable database to students, activists, journalists. They actually rely on our data and testimonies in their research and project. Last but not least, we sponsored um, graduation projects of mass communication students in the University of MSA in, um, in Egypt. The last thing we do is that we offer a safe space for girls. So we established and nurtured one of the biggest and safest online communities where thousands of girls and abuse survivors support each other. Victims also have a chance to their share their stories anonymously and uh, we promote their small businesses so they are economically empowered. So I wanna tell you that we really did so much more than this. I would like to mention it all, but for the time being, I cannot. What was, who is behind this is a very, very small team who do this completely as volunteering. We were never funded, we funded ourselves. I am a student, he had the founder, she's a dentist. We work in the morning and go do our work and speak up at night. But to continue doing this hard work, to continue serving not only Egypt, but regionally and also globally, we want to have next steps. First, we want to obtain funding to hire full-timers who can enable us to perform on an even higher level and efficient level more than now. We also would like to scale the initiative to obtain higher reach in all governments of Egypt with prof uh, professionals addressing local prob uh, problems in each Egyptian government. We would also like to launch a professional blog to feature contributions of, on various topics related to sexual and reproductive health, legal issues regarding harassment and gender awareness topics, and LGBTQ uh, community too. So that's actually going to serve our vision. So we started as, as girls, two women who have been multiply also harassed in Egypt, lived this, um, this fear in going on the streets, being shamed, we want to have a safe community, free of gender-based violence in all its forms, where women and minorities are empowered to speak up for themselves and not be shamed by their society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abira. Um, that was incredible. And to understand that it's entirely voluntary is even more incredible. Um, we are now moving on to our final uh, showcase uh, finalist, which is the youth LGBT organization Destrib from Bulgaria, which is represented by Denita Lubinova. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. It's an honor and a pleasure. My name is Denitza Lubanova, and I'm a lawyer myself. I'm a head of the legal defense program of LGBT organization Deistvia. We're based in Bulgaria, and we focus on legislative changes in the country regarding the rights of LGBTI people. And to do this, we use strategic litigation. Imagine your son was killed and the perpetrators of the murderer were not punished, even though they were known to the police. This is Mikhail Stoyanov. 
Mikhail Stoyanov was killed in 2008 in the center of Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. Mikhail Stoyanov was killed because he looked like gay. In front of the police, prosecution, and later the court, the, the perpetrators of the murder stated that they were cleansing the park from gays. No aggravating circumstances sentence was applied because the Bulgarian criminal code does not recognize the sexual orientation and gender identity and expression bias motivated crimes. And this is Sarah. Sarah was born in December 2019 in Spain. Sarah was born in a family of two women, her UK mother and her Bulgarian mother. Sarah was issued a uh, Spanish birth certificate in which uh, both of her mothers are, were written as parents. As none of the mothers was a Spanish citizen, Sarah could not obtain Spanish citizenship. Her UK mother was a British citizen by descent, and if her child was born outside of the territory of the UK, the child could not obtain British citizenship, which was the case with Sarah. So the only option for her to get any citizenship was to ask the Bulgarian administration to issue her a Bulgarian birth certificate on the basis of the Spanish one, and uh, with the Bulgarian birth certificate to obtain Bulgarian nationality and passport. And she had the full right to do so because one of her parents was a Bulgarian citizen. She was nevertheless refused to be issued these documents. Up to this date, Sarah is two and a half years old and she is still stateless. She is kept a hostage by the state of Bulgaria because on, on the sole reason that she, had two she has two mothers. Sarah is kept a hostage and is kept stateless because the state of Bulgaria lacks any legislation for recognition, the families and partnerships between uh, people from the same sex. A research by, done by my organization, Deistvie, uh, shows legal research of over 70 legal acts in the country shows that LGBTI people in Bulgaria are deprived of over 300 rights that every heterosexual couple has. Um, and not only this, even if you get married, if you get married in outside of the country, the moment you cross the border of Bulgaria, you're no, not any longer married and your partner will not be recognized as your spouse. In up today, uh, Bulgaria has still doesn't have statutory procedure uh, for trans people to change their legal gender. And in 2021, our constitutional court ruled that changing one's legal gender would be unconstitutional. And this is why our main uh, focus and uh, our long-term goal is legislative changes in three main areas. Hate crime legislation, same-sex uh, families recognition, and legal gender recognition. But in order to, um, to achieve these legislative changes, you need to uh, the only way in, in Bulgaria, because there is no political will, the only way to do this is through the strategic litigation. But in order to have strategic litigation, you first need to educate the community what discrimination means and uh, how to fight against an institutionalized homophobia. And this is what we have been doing since the beginning of this project. When we started it back in 2016, we used to have only one person that we gave legal consultation to uh, a month. And um, for 2016 and 17, we filed only one court case. But we kept on educating our community. We kept on educating the administration of Bulgaria uh, police officers around the country how to investigate hate crimes. We kept on 
uh, educating private companies and the general public. We reach with our campaigns over over uh, 100,000 people annually. Only for 2021, we managed to um, give legal advices to, to 120 LGBTI people all around the country and abroad. We filed 60 court cases, 10 of which we consider to be strategic. We also gave 200 psychological support consultations. But our biggest achievement with this project was the case of baby Sarah. The case which reached the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And we successfully litigated this case before the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice. And we, we impacted positively the lives of over 100,000 rainbow families living across the European Union. But we especially impacted the lives of those rainbow families living in countries like Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, Romania, and of course, Bulgaria. The, the case further supported um, the leg legislative amendments in the Civil Code of Germany, but it also supported the European Commission legislative initiative aimed at mutual parenthood recognition. And since, we, since the judgment of this case was published in December 2021, we are facing the snowball effect in my organization. We, every day we receive at least 10 requests for legal consultations and only for April this year we filed 15 court cases in, on a na national level. And we need to go ahead. We need to invest more in uh, legal consultations and in legal cor in court cases because this is the only way to keep our government accountable and to be able to prove the deeply rooted discrimination in our legislation. If we invest in advancing LGBTI rights in countries like Bulgaria, we invest in advancing the democracy in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Danita. Um, how incredible were all five pa panelists and finalists for the equality, um, Equal Rights and Non-Discrimination Project. There are five more that are in a, another session, and so it's, it's very unfortunate that we can't be in all of these rooms together. But I would now like to call upon my five panelists to come and join me in a moderated discussion for about 30 minutes. Um, and depending on the time we have available, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Please. Thank you everybody for um, the incredible insights into your work that has been doing, that has been having ripple effects across your countries and the region in many cases. My first question to all of you is, um, what was the most effective or impactful strategy your project has used? Um, and um, if you could share uh, insights on that for two to three minutes and we'll pass it down. Thank you. The most impactful strategy, right? Um, for us, the most impactful strategy was um, that we were talking to people. Uh, when we started, um, as I said, uh, there was nobody. Uh, people were afraid. Um, people were afraid to to talk about their problems. There was uh, there was uh, non understanding of at all what uh, what discrimination is. People couldn't believe um, that the lack of legislation is discrimination itself. So um, we kept on talking to people. Uh, but I think the breakthrough, the real breakthrough, was when we found, found um, two very uh, strong women who decided, th who got married outside of Bulgaria, came back to Bulgaria, and decided to start a court case for the recognition of their marriage in the country. Um, it started in 2017. 
uh, we lost on all levels, on national level, but the case is right now uh, to be decided by the end of this year by the European Court of Human Rights, and I'm absolutely sure that we're going to win it. And the most uh, important was that these two people, they were they agreed to speak up and they were so public that they were an inspiration for the whole community. And that's how we reached out to thousands of LGBTI Bulgarians. That's incredible and your optimism is very hopeful. So thank you. Um. Yeah, so for Speak Up actually, how we started Speak Up is that um, we had an online forum and we had an online forum where we just wanted to show the society we're having a lot of girls or women who have been harassed one day or you know, one time or another. And this forum, we, re we just posted an anonymous forum and people responded to it. We received thousands of proof of it and then we posted it on our social media accounts and it went viral, like it got 10,000 of shares, more than this. This is when actually we decided to start the page. Throughout the two years, like I just mentioned that um, Speak Up was founded two years ago, um, we built trust. So we have our triangle of network. We have on one side influencers, actress, um, celebrities who trust us so much, they follow us and they always repost whatever we, we had. They also do the hashtags we are posting on. And the second like side of the network is that um, people, they trust us so much. They know that Speak Up, we, d we do not defame anyone. We really pick cases that are true and we go through it till the end. And we don't do any that for a personal interest. And the third side of it are the authorities. So we can say that the Egyptian prosecution page, they, they kind of follow us, they know what we post. They always, when there is a thing, we, when we launch a campaign, they know it and then they start investigating. And this is how we make the impact. So we always drive people to start writing about it, re-educate and we also put we also put social pressure. So the project we're working on that I expect will have the biggest impact is certainly the revised criminal code. Um, to carefully rewrite all of the elements of conduct, results, circumstances, and intent requirements for every offense was a huge undertaking and it affects everything else. It affects the way we're policed, it affects the way that we're punished. And just to give you a sense of how bad DC's criminal code is, we have the same penalty for possession of self-defense spray as we do for possession of an assault rifle. We have three different versions of threats, one that's punishable by 180 days, one six months, one 20 years. And we've given prosecutors a tremendous amount of discretion and authority, and that should be reined in. But at this point, I think when people talk about DC Justice Lab having changed the city, what they're talking about is changing the conversation around community safety in the media, around people's kitchen tables, and people really thinking differently about where we place our faith and trust and how we can instead focus on prevention of harm and harm reduction. So that's what I'm most proud of so far. Um, I think that our best strategy um, until today was to talk to the community and talk to people and listen to, to the women that we work to, with. Um, being um, my, my partners and I, we are all from communities vulnerable communities in Brazil, we are part of the public that we serve, but listening to them through interviews, just to mention, we have done like 2,000 interviews in different communities in Brazil. And to listen to them, to listen what they have to say, because sometimes they only need someone to listen to them to, to talk about their problems. And um, also, being down on the ground with them is really important. It's something that really worked well for us. We have um, an annual week, uh, entrepreneurship week, uh, entrepreneurship empowerment week, where we work with um, many, many, many women uh, to, to develop them and to promote um, women, women's health, uh, entrepreneurship, empowerment, and different um, kinds of education measures and I think yeah and I think that it's been working really really well with us so far thank you I think the most effective strategy we've used so far from the beginning was um, doing the project as a fund so we went to the camp and then we're making distributions of items 
and every other camp official, every other visiting person at the camp felt like that was just the main thing we're doing. So nobody had any idea we're investigating sexual exploitation in the internally displaced camp. And that was very effective because when the project blew up and everybody knew what we're really doing, the later camps we went to, most of the um, humanitarian officers already coached the girls on what to say. And certain times they will come back to tell us. So if we had already published what we're going to do, it meant that from the initial stage, we wouldn't have gotten the core of what was happening in these internally displaced camps. The second thing was using indigenous languages. So oftentimes, a lot of campaigns, you go to communities, you speak lots of English, and people don't take ownership of those projects. So when you're done and you leave, that project is over. But because we're using indigenous languages, we had illustration books transcribed into our local languages, they were able to engage. They were able to make contributions because we also included them in the co-creation of these art books. In the artworks that we did, we taught them how to create artworks and then we allowed them to just create whatever they wanted to from their own imagination, from their own experiences. So that helped them to like come out of their shell, to be more responsive. And then the third thing was including the camp officials and the host communities. So oftentimes with internally displaced camp, because you're always like camped in host communities, and sometimes they have issues with even the host communities. So there's the major crisis, and there's, there's a crisis between camps and host communities because of maybe open defecation, or certain other things the residents are doing that the host communities do not like. So we're able to like talk to host communities, talk to residents, talk to camp officials, and with the camp officials, we understood that they had a monetary issue, which was why they were doing some of the things they were doing. The host communities had their own issue, and then the residents also had their issue. So bringing all of these people created like an inclusive space, so everybody was able to really engage, everybody was willing to listen to us. The camp officials now talk to us very well, and they are always proud to tell us, oh, we're not, no longer, we don't have any camp official who is doing this particular thing in this camp and all of that. So I would say that has, those three has been like the most effective strategies we've used so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the incredible responses. I am going to a slightly modify as moderator and open this for questions now. So if you have a question for our panelists, please um, go to the standing mic on that corner, or we have a roaming mic here. Um, and if, if you could please clarify your name and who the question is targeted to, that would be very helpful. Um, any questions or comments, reflections from the audience? No, no question. Oh, I can see a question. Hi, thank you. Your presentations were so inspiring and encouraging. So my question to you is, after hearing about your colleagues' projects, is there anything that you learned that inspired you from their work or any avenues for collaboration that you see? All right. Um, I think already learning from Justice Lab because she retweeted something yesterday about us as well and then speak up because I had a chat with them as well. I was already seeing some of the works they were doing and it kind of aligned with some of the things we were doing and I felt like this could be room for collaboration where in Nigeria we have limitations. They are doing awesome work in Egypt we could all collaborate and then share resources because we're also limited with some of the things that we know about. Like hearing some of the awesome things they are doing today and some of the strategies they are using is making me also understand that with what we've done, there's still so much that we can do. And especially with the legal aspect of it all, I feel like that's a limitation we have on our pact. And I feel that's something most of uh, my colleagues here have done so well. So having that legal aspect in the work that we do is very key. And I'm looking to work more on building on that aspect. I think that sometimes when we do projects like that, um, we feel uh, alone sometimes. We don't have a lot of people that are doing the same work. We feel like we are the only ones that are trying to change something. And it can be really burdensome. It can be stressful sometimes. And listening to my colleagues and seeing all the work that they are doing, it's so um, peaceful. I, I think it's peaceful to know that there are other people doing 
a really good work, that there are other people um, working for a better place, for a more just society. And it gives me uh, so much hope and happiness to, to, to know that, to be able to witness this. And for collaboration, I am writing my thesis about <laughs> sexual crimes in refugee camps, in UN refugee camps, and I think we can talk a lot about that uh, and collaborate. So, yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, there are, are two shared understandings that I think everyone here uh, has. One is we have a different view of safety, I think, than the way it's normally talked about, and not just how many people have been arrested for what crime and, and how much have you counted it, but do people actually have the things they need to survive, right, and to thrive and to do well and to, and to sleep well at night and take care of their families? And the other thing I noticed was the value of art in all of these projects, which has been really central to DC Justice Lab's mission, and I didn't get to talk about that as much, but that like feature of the photography and the illustrations and all of that I think is not a coincidence. I think that there is real value as change makers in understanding the demechanization that happens through art and being able to think differently and creatively instead of the way we're normally trained as lawyers to say yes or say no uh, based on what we understand the rules to already be. Um, so yeah, I guess also like we were actually looking for like regional and global um, partnerships that we can expand our impact on other um, societies and communities and we already did that like with activists in Brazil and other countries. So having here that we're all like females trying to impact the society, change it, it's really, really so refreshing. It's so amazing because at some point you feel it's so dark and it's it's not gonna change or you lose hope at some time. And when you see here that people in different countries, different continents are working on same issues and addressing it in a great way, it's really amazing. We're also talking, um, um, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. Is there a nickname? Okay. Gunan, yeah, we talked that because Egypt and like Nigeria were both in Africa, and Africa has a lot of problems for women and equality and equality issues. So we're actually talking that we can we can do that like jointly together, and we can address this issue together. Um, especially that speak up perform on online platforms uh, for safety issues. We cannot um, like perform an offline, like the founder who is wearing a yellow tag, <laughs> so no photographs. So that's why it's really amazing where we can perform with other uh, platforms that they perform offline and we can also support them online. And yeah, we can just impact the world. I completely agree with uh, what everybody said. Um, and um, uh, of course, as a lawyer, I can come back to the legal uh, part, which connects uh, basically all of us and how we, in different ways, use the law. Um, and um, for me, although we come from completely different backgrounds and completely different uh, legal systems, uh, for me, uh, the most uh, valuable thing uh, would be to create a network of uh, legal professionals and lawyers um, internationally who can uh, help each other in managing uh, different issues uh, connected to justice and non-discrimination in uh, because um, some of us have international background others have um, European background so everything can be used and can be useful so for somebody else thank you thank you so much team I feel like we should definitely consider renaming it collaboration um, for the next forum because this is an opportunity for so much more in, in just showcasing, but also collaborating and finding new opportunities for everybody. Thank you. Um, any other questions? We are doing well for time, so we can open it up. We have a question here, thank you. Thank you. Not so much a question as an observation. This is a magnificent example, powerful evidence of the WJP's concept that if we created a network, these in-person meetings are the most powerful and impactful, but if we had a network which was humming every day around the world, you would find each other on that network and you would talk and then you would find ways to collaborate. The issues are universal, the solutions are many, and yes, it varies from 
nation state to nation state to some extent, but as the minister said in the last plenary, there are these universal values that we are all pursuing. And so I just thank you for what you're doing and I exhort you and everybody else in the room anywhere who will listen to us, use our network. The example I used to use was of the nurse in Indonesia who finds that <coughs> respiratory problems are because of mold, because her patients live in, in poor apartments and the landlords refuse to deal with the mold. That's not just a health problem, that's a legal problem. And why can't she in the morning find on our network three other examples of that and what they're doing, what their best practices are, what's really effective as a strategy, as an action plan to root that out and to change that. So please celebrate being together as we all are with you today, but remember the network is there 24 hours seven and it should be used by you to find new friends and colleagues and critics, find critics on the, could make you better and more efficient and more productive in what you do. So please take advantage of that and tell us how we can make that network of more value to you because that's one of the founding principles of WJP is if you create this network, they will come and if they come, <laughs> they will talk. And if they talk, they will collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Did anybody else, thank you for the reflection. I think that's very valuable and uh, for sure we can see some threads that will definitely be part of the network and sustaining the network, if anything. So thank you. Um, is there any question or I can ask a question? Um, <laughs> while, while you all think of any other questions, I am going to pose a second question to my uh, brilliant finalists here. And that would be, what advice would you give to other change makers who want to implement a similar project? Um, what's the advice? And you can take two to three minutes to sort of share how this works for you and what's your advice to them. Um, we can start from you actually. Let's start from the middle and we'll okay. go that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I usually don't think of things as advice when I say them, but if I hear someone repeat something I've said, then I'm like, oh, I guess that was a piece of advice that I imparted that they're now imparting on someone else. One thing that I've said to my staff that I hear them repeat a lot is don't be loud and wrong. I am very aggressive in my advocacy style and they often are looking for where that line is between being appropriately aggressive and too aggressive. And that's what I've always said is that if you know something from your own firsthand experience or from your own detailed and thoughtful research, then you say it with your whole chest, right? In a full-throated way and you shouldn't be afraid of that. But if you are uncertain about something or you're repeating something that someone else has said, you need to go back and think about it before you say that too loudly, so. Okay, um, uh, one thing that we used to say, that we say in our organization to the women that we work with is to have more courage than fear. It's okay to have fear, it's okay to be scared, but choose to have more courage than fear. Uh, sometimes because we are uh, a women-led organization and we work with women and from vulnerable aspects, uh, there are so many challenges that are opposed to us, um, so much mistrust. Uh, people just doubt that we know what we know, that we can do what we can do, uh, basically because we are young and because we are women, and we are taking up space in places that we use to be, that we we use to be uh, um, visualized. So, yeah, just choose to have more courage than fear. It's okay to 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 be scared, but make a daily decision to be more courageous. Thank you. Um, I would give two advices. Um, the first would be when you're embarking on a project, especially on sexual exploitation, issues to do with gender-based violence, domestic violence, it's very important to look at um, the repercussions of what you're doing. So when we set out to do our project, one of the things that we didn't envision was some of the things we'll be doing might be putting the lives of the girls at risk. 
And that would be for the interviews, for example, when the camp officials at Ford discovered that we had interviewed some people, some of those girls were dismissed from camp. So that was a negative aspect. And that was something that we didn't think about because we didn't have any idea it was going to happen. It's also more like when you're telling someone to leave a bad marriage, to leave the home where they are being abused, do you have somewhere for them to go to? So these are some of the things that we need to think about when we're embarking on projects like this, that you have certain support in place already for these people before you begin to do certain things. Because even though you want to do something really positive, that positive thing can also still have like a negative effect. The second thing would be take rest. So because we feel like we're champions, we're change makers, oftentimes we feel like we are the omniscient, omnipotent, we shouldn't take breaks. And sometimes it affects you psychological. Sometimes we need breaks to check back on ourselves if we're doing the right thing, how we're doing it, and maybe reflect and take breaks as well. Personally for me, um, there was a time I was involved with um, a migration project. And after I interviewed 30 people, I was having nightmares. I had problems for over six months and I had to see a therapy. That affected me mentally. So we often do not take this thing serious. We don't see the impact of the work that we do on our mental health being. And I think that's something that all of us change makers should learn how to do to ensure that we take breaks and then we also take our mental health seriously. Thank you. So yeah, actually adding to Gunan, <laughs> right? Um, the first thing is that take care of your mental health because um, often, especially if you're female working with females who've been raped or harassed, you feel so emotional and then you feel like, oh my God, all these bad things happened in this world. And sometimes it affects you, even especially if you're young, you know, it really affects you. So you need to take time. You also need to, to talk about it. Do not take it so emotionally. Do not put yourself in the same shoes. Just try to do as much as you can, you know, to change it. Also, it's, it's often so influential that you show the society the problem. Sometimes people think that, oh, there is no harassment, you're just making it up. Or, no, it's not there, I've never been through this. Or they don't think it's, for example, the same way you see it. It's not as strong as you see it. So you need to let them see it. Create an anonymous form, let people talk about it. Talk to people in interviews anonymously if they don't want to show their personality, but show them that it's here. It's just you haven't seen it this way, but it's here. And from there, start the change. Because when you show them the problem and you make them acknowledge it, that's when they're going to hear you and listen to you. Thank you. Well, my advice uh, would be uh, for the people to be patient. Um, because justice requires time. Um, it takes a lot of time, of course, a lot of courage. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a case that I had back in 2015, I think. Uh, a woman was uh, a victim of domestic violence by her same-sex partner. Uh, she was refused to be granted um, protection by the court because um, she was in a same-sex relationship. And according to our law, uh, protection against domestic violence can only be given to different sex partners. Um, we lost the case in front of all instances in Bulgaria, and we filed a complaint to the European Court of Human Rights. This was, we filed the complaint in 2015 to this year. 2021, the case was communicated to the Bulgarian government. Seven years after she was a victim, mm, she might finally get some redress. Um, so yeah, it takes time, uh, but uh, I'm also positive that after the judgment, this kind of judgments by the European Court of Human Rights or other international courts, you also have um, the the measures put to the uh, required by the by the government to change the legislation and yeah it takes time but we have to be patient thank you thank you so much panelists for the very thoughtful reflective responses to that question i think everybody in the room is in awe of the work you do and it definitely speaks to a, a lot of the challenges but also the innovative approaches that you've taken through a development like justice centered lens, centered lens. My final question, because I do not see any hands, 
is, oh, I do see a hand. One question then. <laughs> it's okay, oh, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. My name is Hans Corell, and I was the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and the Legal Council of the United Nations between 1994 and 2004. I listen to your presentations with great admiration and respect. I would like to echo what um, uh, uh, the founder of WHB said a moment ago when he pointed out the importance of the work you do and the importance of networking. I felt strongly when I listened to you and Basically, I think the common denominator here is a very important element for international peace and security, namely empowerment of women. And I have a very special experience here. When I came to the UN, the General Assembly had decided that there should be 50% women in all the departments. And when I looked at my staff lists, I saw that I had 34% women and 66% men. And this had to be realized nine months after I arrived to the UN. That was, of course, not possible. But I made a determined effort here. And after I left the UN after 10 years, I had 50% women in all the department, including at the director level. And this, I think, is so important. And not one single complaint from any men. Every time the decision was made, it was made on the basis of competence. And everybody realized that. So I cannot stress more. And Kofi Annan, of course, was also very interested in this element. So I just wanted to make this comment after having listened to you. Uh, actually, I was rather so moved to hear the difficulties that you have identified here, but the only way to solve this is to work with determination. And I never fail the opportunity of stressing the importance of empowerment of women. And when I speak to men, I always ask them, are you aware of what you could do to do this, to empower women in the position that you have? Because that's very, very important. And I would like to thank again the founder of WHP because that also shows you something else. Initiative. Initiative created the WHP, and I think it's so good to see how this has developed, and you are part of this development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the reflection. I think political willingness to actually implement action is, is such a key part of the work that needs to be done, and so that was very valuable. Okay, the final question to my brilliant finalists is, what's next? You've shared your hopes, you've sh shared your challenges, you've shared what you do, what next for your project? Um, and you know, if you could take a minute to do that, that would be great because that would allow us some time to chat with the, the people in the audience bilaterally before we go to lunch. Um, do you want to kick us okay. off? For me, uh, now, and for my organization, I think implementation. Um, implementation of the judgments uh, that we received and will receive by the end of this year. Um, so the um, Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights uh, judgments needs to be implemented. And this, uh, if you think it's hard to um, go through a court case for seven years nonstop, it's even harder to implement the decision of an international European court uh, into uh, a country which constantly mis, uh, misunderstands what human rights are. Um, so for us, as speak of, I mentioned before that we actually like perform totally well as volunteers and we, we didn't get any fund before we funded ourselves. So we think that the next step is that we really want to obtain fund to expand our team, to also expand our legal team, our um, psychological team. And we want to hire so we can you know, fulfill the testimonies we get every day, the cases we work on, the campaigns we launch. So that's our next step.
I feel like we're just getting started <laughs> being only two years old and there's a lot to still see happen. We're um, still in our first legislative session, for example. And so there are some things that I would really love to see happen before the end of this year in terms of um, actually enacting a lot of the policies that have been proposed and introduced with overwhelming support that are still sitting there pending. And next year, I'm really hoping to be able to take a more proactive approach and set an agenda and introduce policy right at the outset of the legislative session and really change policy making in that way so that it isn't an afterthought after campaigning as it has been routinely in our city and that it's something that people are really um, embracing at the outset and thinking about the people that they serve um, as the first and foremost responsibility that they have. I think that for EcoCycle, we now have to scale. We need to scale up. Um, we want more women to be impacted by our work. We want to, we dream really big because we know that dreaming big and dreaming small has the same work. Uh, so we better dream big, right? And we want to be internationally, I mean, we want to be internationally present. We want to, um, uh, expand to Latin America first or the Americas because we share so many problems. The problems that we have in Brazilian society are so close and so so shareable to other communities and other societies that we know that our work would be really, really recognized, would really be important in other communities. Um, so skating up and being more effective with the government, like being more, um, getting more change in the legislation in Brazil because the, the government that we have now is so um, discouraging and we have to keep going with our work to give more hope to people. Okay, so for us with the Rural Project, we're looking at um, being more into policy influencing. We're looking at the reintegration policy for the people who are in the internally displaced camp because hopefully they are not hoping to stay there forever. And currently there are no reintegration plans or policies whatsoever. So we're hoping to look into that, to work on that. And then we're also looking at a database approach. We're really working to establish like a data management system where there are records of people who are even in the camp because this is also really going to help um, disaster management system. You're like you're coming to make distributions in the camp and you don't know the number of people who are even staying in the camp. Sometimes people from the host communities also come into the camp to take some of those donations. So there's no proper records of the people in the camp if girls are pregnant, for example, you don't know the number of girls pregnant, you don't know the number of girls dismissed, but if we have a proper database system, we're able to really record and know the exact number of people who are in camp, the people who have left, and then also monitor progress, the interventions that have actually been carried out and what those impacts have been. And then the last thing is, we did the first act exhibition last month and it was really successful. We had 10 girls on a two weeks training and they were able to like produce three at work per girl. So we had 30 at works. So we're really looking to establish like an art exhibition forum where we train these girls on the camp and they consistently make at work which are sellable. And this at work, the proceeds from them are then used to set them up either in school or businesses that they want to do. So that would be like it moving forward for us, thank you. Thank you. On that invigorating note, I would like to call this panel to a close. Thank you so much, everybody, each and every one of you. Thank you, attendees, for making this panel an exciting conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Please don't forget to be a part of the closing ceremony where the awards will be, you know, the, fi the finalists will be put into winning categories. The the very difficult task that is on, in the hands of the judges right now. Judging is still ongoing, um, but please feel free to get in touch with each of them and the other wonderful f finalists that have boots downstairs. Um, thank you all so much and looking forward to staying connected. Thank you. Bye.